technology is not neutral. Inherently, it's going to take on the values of the person creating it. Um, and whether this person knows that they're biased or not, their values go into what they're creating. Um, and so I think it's really important that people consider what they don't consider and talk to other people. Um, I mean, that's why we're here now with the Algorithmic Justice League is because people did not consider others as they were creating technology. Hi, my name is Dr. Jaleesa Trapp. I am a postdoc at the MIT Media Lab. I met Dr. Joy as a graduate student. Uh, so when I first started at the Media Lab, she was in her first year of PhD and I was starting out in my master's. What excites you and concerns you about the role AI might play in the future of education, specifically and community organizing? It's hard to answer what excites me right now because I have more concerns. Um, I think what concerns me about AI and education is that our education system, at least in the United States, already has a lot of disparities. And so while some schools may be getting resources, others are not. Um, so there's a lot of young people that are going to be left behind um, with AI, um, with learning AI tools. But then also there's um, the fact that a lot of schools still don't know how to regulate um, AI tools, so you see some schools just outright banning it. Um, you see some young people not really learning how to use AI as a tool, but instead using it as a replacement for human interaction. Um, and so I'm really concerned about um, all of those things. I'm hoping that people take a step back and really analyze how people are using AI across the country and across the globe. So did you have any ideas about how educators or the education systems uh, can regulate AI? Yes. So I think first, everybody in the education system needs to actually understand um, how harms in AI occur. Um, I think that that's one of the issues right now is there's not a full understanding of how these systems work um, and how they can reproduce harm. Um, so really starting with educating the educators, the administrators on how this happens. Um, you see now in some schools, visitors have to walk up to a camera and put their face in a camera in order to enter. Um, if this camera misidentifies someone, they possibly can't pick up their student. Um, and that's just one way that, um, that it's being used in schools. Um, but yeah, I think starting but with education at the educator level um, and then deciding together with educators, administrators, and families how to regulate it um, and how to improve the systems. Because I think that right now um, what's happening is people just don't know. So yeah, do you have any other specific AI harms that people could become aware of? Um, and what, what the, should, should they be looking out for? And, and what are they specifically? Okay, like, I have a whole list. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I guess it depends too, like, um, some harms also, so in addition to facial recognition technologies, you have people using AI to make decisions, um, AI to take attendance, and then possibly AI to decide punishment based on things like attendance or um, homework turn-in rate um, without really taking a human approach and finding out why is this student missing classes? Why is this student not turning in homework? Um, maybe it's a medical issue, um, but AI can't determine that based off of how many times this person has missed class or how many times this person is late. Maybe they have to drop off a younger sibling at school before they can get to school. Um, and so I think that really taking the time to understand how these systems work um, and not saying eliminate AI completely, but how to work with it. Maybe AI is just the first step and, oh, OK, I noticed that you're missing a lot of classes. How do we um, mitigate this? Or maybe you can't, <laughs> uh, but really, I think that people don't understand. And so 
not letting AI make all of the decisions for you, but really using it as a tool. Yeah, so people are outsourcing like their own decision making basically to these AI without fully understanding. Yes. Yeah. Um, so are there any bold steps that you believe that educators, researchers, and technologists can take to ensure AI doesn't widen the digital divide? I think that AI has already widened the digital divide. Um, and it's hard to see, um, as a researcher, I see AI making so many advances. I see things changing every day rapidly. But then um, I go home to my own community and I see people not knowing about these advances, not knowing the capabilities or what's possible. Um, you see people doing things like oh, let me use AI to write a paper for me, or let me use AI to see what I would look like in the future, um, which is okay to a certain extent, but I think that there is already a big gap, um, and that is AI is just reproducing the harms that have already been there. What, From your perspective, what are the biggest risks AI poses to social equity and inclusion today? <sighs> <laughs> I think that the biggest risk is that the same people who have are always been in positions of power are still in power with AI. Um, and so you see things being reproduced on just another level. Um, you see communities being over-policed now with AI to detect uh, gunshots supposedly, um, you see AI being used to determine if somebody is a suspect or not. Um, you see AI being used in the courtroom to determine somebody's sentencing. Um, and so I think one of the biggest things is the same people who are already biased towards other groups are still making these decisions, but just with technology. And so do you believe the tech tech can be neutral or is tech also biased? Technology is not neutral. Um, inherently, it's going to take on the values of the person creating it. Um, and whether this person knows that they're biased or not, their values go into what they're creating. Um, and so I think it's really important that people consider what they don't consider and talk to other people. Um, I mean, that's why we're here now with the Algorithmic Justice League is because people did not consider others as they were creating technology. So tell me a little bit more about that, like you, why you're here with Algorithmic Justice League. Uh, what does that mean to you? To... Yeah. Um, so I'm here with the Algorithmic Justice League because I think that it is important and it's my duty as an educator um, to make sure that all of the people that I'm working with know. Um, I think that so as a high school computer science teacher, as an undergraduate teacher, I like to make sure that the young people I'm working with know that what they create has consequences, whether it's good or bad, um, and that their values go into the work. And so making sure that they take that into consideration, that they talk to other people when they're creating things, whether it's a simple website or they're creating a new AI tool, that they know that this piece of technology is, represent, is a representation of their values, of the values of the people that they're designing for. Um, and the Algorithmic Justice League values align with my values. So um, I thought it was important for me to join on as a delegate. OK, so are there any promising examples of AI-powered tools that enhance collaboration and community-centered creative learning? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> TBD. <laughs> I'm hopeful that there will be AI tools that can enhance uh, community-centered design and creative learning. I think that it's going to take a lot of creativity um, and a lot of collaboration to design these tools. But I am hopeful. I just don't think that we're there yet. <laughs> What does design justice mean to you when applied to AI systems? Design justice when it comes to AI tools um, looks like starting from the ground up. Um, right now, AI tools are 
they're created and they're just deployed uh, without talking to people in the community, without mm -hmm. really figuring out what people need and what they want. Um, so it would look like starting um, in communities, whether it's um, in schools, talking with educators, students and families, or going to a community center and really figuring out what it is that people want. Um, I think that there's a lot of AI tools that could be created to help people, um, help people with social services, help people get regular daily tasks done, help workers get tasks done. Um, that isn't really thought about because of all of the things that AI can do. Doesn't mean that we should use it for that. Uh, but I think that design justice would look like really talking to people and figuring out what people would find the most useful um, with these tools. How do we make sure then that the communities who are most impacted by this technology, like how do we ensure that they are taking part in, in creating it? And yeah, do you have ideas for that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, I think one way to hold ourselves accountable is to partner with community organizations and to really make sure that people who are most impacted have a seat at the table and not just a seat at the table because that just implies that they give their opinions but are really involved from the start to the end. Um, I don't think that projects are ever really done. Um, how many iterations of Twitter and Instagram are there? There's always a new update um, and I think that people should be involved. Um, I think that People just need to ask. A lot of times communities aren't even asked um, and they do want to be involved. Going to a school, working in a school myself, um, so many times people didn't ask to volunteer. When I said, hey, would you be interested? They'd be like, oh, I didn't know that was a possibility. Uh, but just simply asking and uh, building a relationship, also not making it transactional, um, actually building relationships with communities to value their input um, and their collaboration. Well, I think that's it. Okay. <laughs>